know why I love working with you. You're the only girl singer who sings as loud as I do, opens her mouth as loud as, as wide as I do. Well, I don't know. That's because when we sing, we like to get a good breath down there, and the only way to get it is to open up. And surely, sometimes I open my mouth so wide, I close my eyes, I can't see the cue. I know. I had a, an agent a long time ago when I first came out here to Hollywood, hey, who said, um, I think I'm going to find it a little difficult to book you into movies because you just don't look attractive when you sing. He says, do you have to open your mouth that wide? Can't you just have a little pretty mouth like this? Pete, like that. Persimmon. Yeah, peachy persimmon. How can you, how can you and, sing like that? Uh, but you can. I mean, like, for instance, try, try to do day in, day out. Like that. Mm hmm? Yeah. Do you, do you, do you. Ah, you've cut yourself in your I know it, I know it. <laughs> I think that's what I sort of had in mind for this spot because I've got the wrong cue cards up and nobody's helping us. Oh, do you realize well, we did? Um, well, let's just look at where we're going. Yeah. Do you want to start over again now or shall we do it next week? <laughs> <laughs> it can't be done. Look, why don't I first. Why don't I first sing so It's Chinese on there. Yeah, know. all right. <laughs> Where shall we go I'm, back to? I don't know. Let's do Let me do a song of yours. Right? Yeah. Because this oh. is a worse retake than it was an original. We were in trouble. Sure. <laughs> you want to know something? Right. That's the way it's got to be. Since all the time. Rehearsed yeah. it that way, okay? Right. Now, I wouldn't say cut. I'd just say press. Thank you for tuning into Advanced TV Herstory, where we strive to elevate the importance of TV women by telling their stories. We know how seeing ourselves on television impacts our own growth and confidence. There's gold and inspiration in the decades of great work by underappreciated, often forgotten, significant, talented women. Thanks for listening and sharing this podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. Listeners, that was Judy Garland and her guest, Lena Horn. We're devoting five podcast episodes to The Judy Garland Show, which ran from 1963 to 1964. 26 episodes. Why, you ask? Well, so do we. What is the series' place in TV history? Dozens of books and documentaries about Judy Garland. You've seen them. And there's more out there. There's a, a movie in the works, and there's a bio musical that's going to make its way to Broadway. They fairly consistently recount facts. Over the years, they've drawn in firsthand accounts from people who had worked with her, many whose careers had started with hers on the MGM lot in the late 30s. Certainly, when a person, a woman, becomes an American legend at the age of 16, she lives a life bound to be documented by those around her. Celebrity. In life and death, Judy's star is, was, surrounded by men. In life, there were husbands, agents, close musical colleagues, arrangers, and composers. There was Mickey Rooney and JFK. In death, there have been legions of biographers and documentarians. Her husband, Sid Luft, who meticulously repackaged the Judy Garland show for DVD release so it can remain an American treasure. And then there are gay men all over the world who have a special affinity for Judy. Which leaves me asking, where are the women? Women certainly shared the stage with her. Lena Horne, Ethel Merman, Barbara Streisand, Diane Carroll, Judy's daughters, Liza and Lorna. This question feels more important because 50 years later, American women likely still think they have very little in common with Judy, which is what originally got me started on this was wondering why my mother, who has since passed, didn't like Judy Garland. Mom, there's a movie with Judy Garland. Ugh, she'd say. So my mother and many other American women didn't think they had a lot in common with Judy, is my guess. It's not like they hated her. They just didn't love her. Hmm. Does that sound vaguely 2016? What's not to like about the story of a woman who battled addiction yet managed to become one of the most talented American performers of all time? I think, rooted in these questions, which require an understanding of generations and the herstory of feminism, 
is a default observation made by so many that for so many years, American women, and indeed white women, have been hard-pressed to outrightly support other women. And maybe there are some who others found it easier to support. Catherine Hepburn, because she, was, she wore pants and she wasn't overtly sexual. Or we liked Dinah Shore because she was so darn friendly and she could sing, but she wasn't too showy. She wasn't a belter like Judy. Or more recently, Oprah, because she's Oprah. So was it that they didn't like Judy because... She sang and performed and spoke at a frenetic pace that she had body language that indicated that she was somewhat uncomfortable, yet very comfortable on the stage, or that she was just so thin. Then there's this other fact in terms of how it is that we can view Judy as a feminist. Was she one? Did she think about it? I mean, feminism as the, you know, the feminine mystique by Betty Friedan and everything, that was... I was only on the cusp. Judy was a couple steps before that, a couple of years before that, and really a life removed, a generation removed from what Betty Friedan was trying to impart on the next generation. So there is this point that Judy is on record. Now remember, her every move had been monitored by studios and movie magazines since she was like 14 or 15. But at one point, Judy is on record as having written this sentence. In the obscure recesses of their hearts, all women realize they know, they know, they know that the male must lead, the female must follow. End quote. End quote from Judy Garland. I'm asking, was that really her statement? How old was she when she wrote it? This, this got brought up from Gerald Clark, who wrote a book called Get Happy in 2000. I, I just have to believe that somebody ghost wrote it for her quite possibly a man, because who would think to put that into a woman's mouth, a a successful woman who had been earning significant salary since she was 14? But there it is, Gerald Clark's Get Happy, page 375. To his credit, Clark's analysis found the quote to be a bit ironic too, thank you, given that it had long been men at every turn who had let Judy down, who had stolen from her, who had left her. The quote is in Clark's book. I can't cite its origin. But if it was attached to her in any way in 1962 or 63, if that was kind of part of the legend and the lore, it would certainly explain why men expected her to behave the way she did and why her own interest in finally owning her work, more than just collecting a check, may have seemed to them like a passing fancy, like she was not going to follow through. Apart from the addiction, apart from everything else, In the end, Judy wanted it done for her. So maybe if this was in her heart a turning point for her, an opportunity for her to finally own it, she maybe should have been a bit more bold in the pronouncement that she wanted that creative control of her show and her life. (laughs) Listeners, this is not a topic for a novice or a dreamer. This was a very complicated life, and there was a lot written about her, and it's fascinating which is why it was fascinating for me to encounter recently Angela Ingersoll right here in Chicago. Angela has developed a one-woman-plus orchestra show that tells Judy's story and it sings her song. It's a jukebox. And its core is Judy from the 60s, 60s Judy, as Angela calls her, which ran those 26 episodes. And It brought that project, which had previously sort of been sitting on my list of things to do, Judy Garland, to something that was very real and tangible because Angela knows her Judy. What I find intriguing and the reason why you're sitting in this seat is because you are a woman Mm. voicing the life and the challenges and the struggles and the tremendous triumphs of Judy Garland. Because when we think about all of those books, Mm -hmm. other than Lorna Luft, and I think Anne Edwards from Mm -hmm. the 70s, not many of those books were written by women. Is that right? That's true. And also uh, not many performers who tribute Judy Garland have been women. There have been quite a lot of men (laughs) who have done beautiful and moving. Jim Bailey, of course, being the uh, the most prominent uh, performances to keep alive her legacy in in a way that tells us about the time we live in now, you know, and and there have been uh, certainly wonderful male artists who have done that. And it's been a while 
or maybe forever, if I if I may say, since we've seen um, a female artist step into uh, Judy's shoes in a way that was important to uh, our time now. So I'm very blessed to get to be that person who has uh, been sent this calling. It feels like it feels like a calling to it, me. It feels <laughs> like a calling to me too, and I feel like now is the time. Yeah, we need to we need to celebrate American women's talent who got us here the women who got yep. us here and we're going to talk about some of the ceilings that she broke through some of the the doors she busted through mm -hmm. and sat down and did not move her tiny four foot eleven frame <laughs> did not true. move and so um she really leveraged a lifetime of very hard work and and i admire you for also bringing that 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 work ethic to you know everything that that you present in your get happy show Thank and we're going to get back to talking about get happy mm -hmm. is is are the values that that really brought judy forward that that came out of hollywood that even though we as midwesterners mm -hmm. um we saw it we didn't really understand the whole hollywood scene the the life that she led on the backside but um but she, she very much was a part of the great american century known as the 20th century yeah so. and the music of the 20th century uh it, it also is something that's still so important to uh, American culture in the 21st century. I think the music of the 20th century, particularly all these great standards that, that Judy was singing, the oldies of her day and the new songs that were written for her at that time, I feel like these songs in the 21st century are a currency for audiences to feel like we have something in common. You know, we uh, all know the words to something like over the rainbow. It's going to take a lot more storytelling and pouring over research by women and even mining the feminist consciousness of daughters Liza and Lorna, for there to be greater understanding of how Judy Garland's TV series influenced TV and women. So even when we tell the story of how the series made it to TV, which I do in a separate podcast episode, it has a totally different level of energy coming from a woman. So tell us, Angela Ingersoll, mm -hmm. guest in the studio today. Oh, you guys. Tell us about the Get Happy Show, how it is that your your career sort of now has really become premised on this Judy Garland tribute and the Get Happy Show and, and how you arrived at sort of the format and and it's and the and the audience's interest. Thank you. Uh, I shall. I, it's my love child, along with the guidance of my husband, Michael Ingersoll, who's a performer and producer. And so much of the inspiration came from his support. Uh, he was uh, my husband was a Jersey boy for a long time who ended up starting his own group called Under the Street Lamp and they made a number of PBS specials and toured around and so he transitioned from the theater world to the concert world and while he was making that transition I was working mostly in Chicago theater and uh, I couldn't help but be interested in that concert world the more I learned about it from him so over time I, I began to get an itch and say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm a little tired of the fourth wall. I'm a little tired of uh, suspending the disbelief when I see an audience. I want to have more of a direct connection with audiences. And uh, therefore, I wanted to step into the concert world. And as I was doing so and trying to figure out how to write material for myself, um, I realized what I wanted to talk about more than anything in the world was Judy Garland. And I took the advice of all of my f most favorite artists whose biographies I've read and, and, and great artists I have been able to meet who told me, eventually you got to write your own work. Nobody's going to do it for you. And that was really the impetus behind all of this. So as I began to write about Judy, it, it felt like a big, uh, a, a really big risk because I, I, I wanted to dare to tell the world that I could do her justice. Only in the last few years have we really come to know Hollywood's darkest secrets about ageism, racism, and sexism. Pick a headline, pick a statistic, and rewrite any woman's life story of what it could have been if a power play hadn't been used against her. And more realistically, not just a woman's career, but rather any person of color's career as well. Somebody with immense talent, young, energetic, willing to do the work to put out a quality product. And what person up in the power structure decided that that was not going to advance? 
It's clear from the research that Judy leveraged her own power. She understood the the power of representation and what her name could bring to somebody and their career and how few there were like her on TV in their mid-40s. And, and listeners, if you haven't had a chance to listen to my episode on Dinah Shore, our <laughs> TV's Smiling Feminist, it's, it is a reminder that these women who came up through the trenches, through TV, through radio, in, in, uh, or film and radio, in, in Dinah's case, they knew they had the power to open a door, or in some cases, when the network would have preferred to have white performers or preferred to have mm-hmm. uh, you know, a, a white orchestra. And for artistic reasons, both Judy and Dinah wanted, you know, they wanted... Their their pick. They wanted Lena Horn. They wanted Diane Carroll. Absolutely. They pitched a fit. They they drew the line in the sand and they said this will happen. Right. And they did. And therefore, they, they were difficult to work. And with. they were difficult to work with. <laughs> they never got the credit for that happening. Of course. Not. And th- that is some of America's most treasured TV, mm-hmm. and is so representative. I mean, my gosh, when you think about anybody watching those shows, any any time you can get a hand on a clip, even right. The impact that that must have had for a black family right. viewing right. on a Sunday night or whenever D- the Dinah show. Well, Dinah, right. Dinah did it more on radio, I guess, but she also did it on TV. And, you know, just for a short time, um, one of the greatest African-American artists, uh, Nat King Cole, had a television show for a very short time. It didn't last long because most of uh, most of the advertisers pulled right. Right. their support from the network because uh, they didn't feel that that this black man should be welcomed into America's homes, which right. is just astonishingly right. upsetting to me. But Nat came away with a really, really fabulous quote as to why his television show was uh, canceled. And he simply said, I suppose Madison Avenue is afraid of the dark. Listeners, it's it's just important sometimes that we continue to weave these threads in such a way that it isn't an aberration. It isn't just Judy being Judy. It mm-hmm. was Dinah being Dinah. And it was a lot of other women who were, you know, I guess they would probably got when you think about, mm, I don't want to go here, but um, okay. when we watched, when we all watched on FX. Feud? Are you thinking about Feud? feud? Yes. Yeah. And I, I watched it. Yeah, that 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 was, was so Betty real. And that was Betty and Joan. And in 1961 and 62, there was very little TV for them. Oh, God, they were sure. not able to transition. So what these women were dealing with, even at the ripe old age of 40, which is where Judy was, mm-hmm. was ageism as well as sexism. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So she refers to herself as as an old lady over and over again on that show. She introduces a clip of a song uh, from one of her films, and she says, uh, this is from a a picture I made called Little Nellie Kelly. It's about 1782 I made that. (laughs) (laughs) Self-deprecation that she thought ensured survival. Oh, what? Why do we have to diminish ourselves in order to seem approachable, in order to seem real? Nonetheless, the Judy Garland show boasted a solid guest lineup. It was American culture and society. It was the early 60s. So we had JFK as our president. The baby boom stretches from 1946 to 1964. So we are heading into the what is truly the, the, the phase of great change that we know of to be the 60s. Right. The world was changing so quickly then for everyone. And those young baby boomers, they were kind of, they were ready for their own sound. They were ready for their own look. And Judy, though, represented, I think, for the mm-hmm. the moms and the dads watching yeah. TV, that was the little slice of the good middle old age. Days. Right. Yeah, and, she and, was the good and who old they days grew up and, with. And the greatest generation's Girl Next Door, you know, from all those great 1940s uh, war propaganda movies mm-hmm. and things like from Me and My Gal, Judy was a piece of yesteryear that did not fit in with how the world was changing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Judy wasn't cool, though she was fascinating and talented. And it, it seems like if if her TV show would have hit just a little earlier, it could have had more success as a, and as a staple in the American home. Mm-hmm. But because we waited until 63 to even begin the process of filming, by this time, rock and roll is hitting. We see artists like uh, Neil Sedaka losing their popularity because the Beatles are coming. Mm-hmm. So things that were that represented all of this feel-good, smiley, um, 
poppy American art mm -hmm. are being replaced by the British invasion, mm -hmm. by uh, new sounds that are that are coming up from from black music, from southern rock and roll, from uh, and from England, all saying it's time for a new sound, a louder sound. We we want to be heard instead of being presented as as American youth a packaged happy mm -hmm. version of our entertainment. To be a guest on Judy's show required vocal talent above all else at a time when orchestral music had given way to guitars and drums and an occasional horn or bass. Guests had to fit into Judy's style or at least complement it. Ed Sullivan, which was the show, the Ed Sullivan show, preceded her time slot on Sunday nights that year. Ed could be more adventurous in his lineups because the show did not revolve around his singing talent. He was, in a sense, the arbiter. He was the one out there scouting the fresh stuff. So it was a big deal for young performers to be on the Ed Sullivan Show. As long as the Judy Garland Show's format remained unsettled, it varied from week to week, the best Judy and her orchestra could do would be to serve as that transitional stage of American music, out with the old and in with some of the new. So, listeners, having come to this place, this whole mindset about Judy Garland and what the deep story is, the backstory, the, the context, Angela and I have consumed much of the same Judy biographical material, and we've We've scoured everything that there is on YouTube, and in fact, <laughs> Angela's created a little bit more of it. As a much more public face of Judy's music and style, however, Angela has collected hundreds of personal stories from audience members around the world. He's a, he's a very, uh, very generous-hearted man who, you know, gave me his blessing for the, for the work that I'm doing, keeping her legacy alive in a, in a responsible and compassionate way. You know, it's so easy for a larger than life icon to be turned into a caricature. Yes. And um, it, it's important to me that she is a uh, living, breathing human being in our minds that we can learn from and not just some uh, oversized cartoon of the past. We are wiser and more compassionate as a general population, I would like to think. Yeah. now and consumers of entertainment than we've ever been so oh i let, sure hope you're let's right let's talk yeah. about those consumers of entertainment who come to your shows what mm. is that audience like and who are they and what do they think goodness it uh, luckily it's it's just get, it's getting more and more diverse which makes me terribly happy that's the whole point isn't it to bring people together of course there are a lot of um older folks at my shows and folks who saw judy live back in the day and bring me recollections of uh, of what it was like to be in the same room with her and, and feel like they're seeing her all over again. There are certainly young people, little, little kids, you know, who are being mm -hmm. brought by their parents or, or, or grandparents who want to see Dorothy and end up coming home with a, a lot more than that because, of course, that's just the beginning of, of Judy's story and Judy's impact as far as I'm concerned. So, yes, they get, uh, they get their... Uh, their hello wizard of oz uh introduction <laughs> but there's there's so much more to experience so hopefully their interest gets uh peaked in lots of different directions as as mine was at that age and there's also of course a very large population of gay folks especially men uh of homosexual men in the audience because judy meant so much to the homosexual community and and continues to be a great icon for for that community and See an actual clip of Angela and Joey from the Mother's Day tribute on YouTube. Uh, I link to that in the show notes. So make no mistake, listeners, from a feminist perspective, this feels in hindsight like a really tough, tough lesson about show business's cutthroat nature, and it was borne out at Judy Garland's expense. Her talent was mismanaged from her teenage years, she was addicted to stimulants and depressants to keep her performing on little sleep when she was a teenager, and that condition made her more vulnerable in ways that we can only imagine. But there were a few victories that year, 1963 and 1964, where otherwise it appears CBS let her down at every turn, seemingly wanting her to fail. The victories, the victories. 
So for us to truly understand an extraordinary piece of TV history, which is the story and the video combined, Angela and I revisited Judy's relationship with President John F. Kennedy. How do we retain our sense of hope? And of course, at the beginning of the 60s, uh, the, the, she's kind of like hope. an Oprah of the moment. She she had an Oprah moment there in 1963. I can on see her that. Series. Yeah, because uh, you, she's trying to represent for people why it's relevant to keep the good oldies alive. Um, but she doesn't want to be in a time capsule. She doesn't want to be put on a shelf and forgotten forever. She's a living, breathing, passionate woman and human being. So she's trying to keep it relevant now, um, which is what I am interested in doing with her music now. And she was recognizing that the world was changing. You know, we've got at this time at the beginning of, si of the 60s, a young president who's filling a momentum of a generation of people who she knew full of because, hope. Because she they all close. traveled in very fancy, she was, yeah, she influential was circles. close friends with John Kennedy. She deeply, deeply, deeply admired him. So she, Judy originally met Kennedy, uh, as far as I know, through her friend Peter Lawford. You know, Peter Lawford was in uh, Easter in Parade, yeah, mm -hmm. and was brother-in-law. And so... When I mentioned you, Judy was quite ill at the end of the 50s and hospitalized. We talked about her weight had mm -hmm. uh, ballooned. There was fluid surrounding all of her organs. Nobody really, uh, people thought Judy was done. Peter Lawford invited Judy to campaign for Kennedy's 1960 presidential election, and this gave her life purpose and focus. She was caught up in the momentum of the hope of the moment and uh and she was back out there singing and touring and it really credited kennedy with a miraculous recovery she got back on her feet she got out of bed and she was motivated she wanted to sing for people again and she wanted to she believed in the rainbow again in his book the judy garland show rainbow's end researcher author coin stephen sanders interviewed nearly every living show crew member from that evening. A number of higher-ups in production, writing, and direction guided him through the many details of the 26 episodes, delivering shared memories which can leave you with the strong impression that this, all of this stuff about the president, really happened. Judy did, in fact, have the capacity to get a direct phone call into the president. They would talk on the phone. She would sometimes sing to him on the phone. It's that connection then that when he was assassinated in November of 1963, Ugh. that uh, she felt, you know, again, this woman, <laughs> the show was eponymous. The show was the Judy Garland show. And mm -hmm. she was the smartest woman in the room. She was the only woman in the room right. in most cases. And this devast America was devastated. America was in yeah. mourning that was never going to be understood in part because it was seen on TV. The Zabruder right. film was available. People, yeah. it wasn't just, it, it was a headline and then it was gone. It was documented. Judy was a mother and wanted to care for people in that moment. Judy wanted to offer some healing and understanding to the devastation everybody was feeling in the moment. And the way that she knew how to do that was in song. So Judy wanted to dedicate a song to her friend, uh, Jack Kennedy. Well, she wanted to dedicate a whole show, in yeah, a sense, she did. to all she of did. America. Yeah. And, um, and do something healing for America. But the executives at CBS had another idea. They did not want this woman to uh, become outspoken on their platform. They did not want this woman to be political on their platform. They felt that talking about what was going on in America at all at the time, talking about Kennedy's assassination and even recognizing this tragedy uh, was too political. And no, you're just here to be the entertainment. You just keep, you just tap dance and, and take home your paycheck and shut up. She absolutely wasn't having it. You know, she was somebody who, who cared deeply about others and song was the only way she had to reach out to their hearts and make them feel her heart mm -hmm. and so she said i have to dedicate this song to john well they cut the, the executives cut judy's dedication from the broadcast but she did sing uh, a song for him and that was the battle hymn of the republic she took 
this iconic American anthem, and she pointed it toward the deep chaos and confusion of the moment in a completely new and uh, shockingly progressive way. She took something very traditional and uh, said, right now, what we need is 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 peace and i'm going to take the anthem of what seems like the old ways and i'm going to tell you how we move forward in new ways and it is not repeating the mistakes of the mistakes of the past when she sings the lyric within that song as he died to make men holy let us die to make men free Mm -hmm. she is very clearly talking about the work that john kennedy was doing Mm -hmm. to progress america's ideals as far as civil rights were concerned as far as uh social justice were concerned and the leadership Um, of the united states in the world given the fact that her initial audience mm -hmm. was the greatest generation the ones who had fought world war right one and two they were all viewing the absolutely and she was watching bonanza (laughs) right she was you know taking them by the hands and saying Let's not lose sight of the good work that he was doing because mm-hmm. I believe in it and I believe in you. Mm-hmm. And, and we're all Americans. Yeah, and I want this anthem to remind us of the best within us. Mm-hmm. And and that means we got to keep moving forward. We can't fall back on fear and saying that the old way is the best just because it's what we know. Now I'm going to test you. I did not prepare you for this question. Okay. The Battle Hymn of the Republic, mm-hmm. is that traditionally <laughs> sung by men or women? Um, Can you think of women who have ever performed it? I cannot. I know that the poem was written by a woman. The lyrics come from a woman. And that wouldn't have been a Kate, and that was never sung by Kate Smith? She did. Oh, it must did, have but been. But she did Must't God Bless it? America. She did God Bless America. Oh, I wish I had my magic answer box of the internet right in front of me uh, in my hand, because it does certainly seem like Kate Smith must, but I don't have another version in my head at this moment sung by a woman. But no. Kate Smith was the only other patriotic belter, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can't think of another off the top of my head that's saying in that style, which is so very American. You mm-hmm. know, the belting style that comes up out of uh, out of vaudeville. Emotion. That was a, that yeah. was very that was very American. It was anti the classic bel canto singing of the uh, the uh, European classical Italian tradition. The belting was Americans being nasal and getting out there and and. Uh, <gasps> If Not, you can't sing well, sing loud. Exactly, yes, as exactly. My, as my German teacher used to say. <laughs> Judy planned to close the show that was going to be taped on December 11th with the standard The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Now, from all reports, that week, remember America was still in mourning, was a difficult one for Judy and, by extension, everyone on the show, including Ethel Merman. Listeners, Ethel Merman was considered the first lady of the American musical comedy stage. At 36 years older than Judy, so in her 70s, and many inches taller, she was a force, she was a belter, and she was a name as well known as Judy's. So this was one of those weeks where Judy had to be on. Merman's week of rehearsals went according to schedule with nary a glimpse of Judy. Nowhere. Instead, there was a stand-in who basically stood in order for there to be lighting and blocking and choreography for it all to get executed. Judy was tense and nervous all week, or so the reports say. Was it handling the stressor moment of the nation in mourning? Was it having the legendary Ethel Merman on her show? Or maybe it was the nerves building up as she prepared to call a a quarterback sneak in the form of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Sanders's book included rich reflections from key witnesses like executive producer Bill Colloran. Now, remember, it is unbeknownst to CBS that she was going to do this. Bill Colloran to coin Sanders, quote, The first time Judy sang it was at the dress rehearsal. The first one, I think, was even better, if that's possible, than the one that aired. That's right. That's when, right before she sang it, She looked straight into the camera and said, This is for you, Jack. It was a powerful moment in my life. I will not forget that for as long as I live. Never. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. People on their knees crying. It was devastating. I was sobbing out loud. I've never been so moved in my life by anything, anybody, or any drama. Nothing compared to what that did to me the first time she sang it. 
She gave every bit of her soul to that number. Everything that was Judy Garland was there and on the line at that moment. Everything that she had to give. Executive producer Colleran recounted. He goes on to say, The final taping was an hour later. She felt so deeply. She knew what she had. She got a standing ovation. The audience was crying. They were so moved. When she came backstage, she was crying and I was crying. She was pleased at doing it for Jack. She knew what she had done. She was very easy. She was very quiet. Everyone just quietly went home. I was handling her very carefully that night. She was very, very fragile. She had given so much. I can see that little four foot 11 inch gal standing there, her head higher and higher, tears streaming down her face as she sang her heart out. It's moments like this that make you forget your problems. End quote from Bill Colloran. Now that you know the story, listeners, please find the clip on YouTube. Regardless of what country you call home, you're sure to tingle when you hear her start out measured. Like maybe she was thinking CBS would pull the plug mid-song, and then she goes and winds up strong. You see it in her body as well, and the tiny smile of satisfaction when she hits the home stretch. She is a real belter, and she delivered. Now, I consider myself a pretty astute student of TV trivia. And why hadn't anyone ever told me about Judy Garland's rendition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic? I come up with these answers. Because the series didn't air in reruns until only recently. Even the Ju- I mean, the Patty Duke show was only on for a couple more seasons with sequentially more episodes. But the Patty Duke show actually airs. I think it's because variety shows tend to be overlooked for their historical and cultural value. We don't talk about variety shows the way that we talk about series. I think it's because singing the song, as Garland did, while lauded, was an action that was not sanctioned by CBS executives. So you can bet your bottom dollar that they weren't going to promote this ever This was never going to be in the recap best of the last 50 years of CBS TV. She went around their backs and she was going to pay a price. Maybe it's because the whole effort and sentiment was woefully misunderstood. Only recently, perhaps now that social media has made us more connected, do we understand how important it is for public mourning. When you think about it, When done right, variety shows offer us layers of cultural significance that almost you can't obtain in any other way. Most importantly, back when TV was basically born out of three major networks. When you think about the Cher show or the Sonny and Cher show, they were fresh and fascinating. This was fresh music. It was was its own look. Carol Burnett's variety show made her a TV icon in her own right. She put this woman's face on comedy for 279 episodes, and everyone can name their top five best bits when they laughed and laughed and laughed. But Carol did not bring 30 years, 40 years of show business and awards and best-selling records to her first day on the set. No, she didn't. And then there are the men, Andy Williams and Dean Martin and the countless other variety shows hosted by men. Well, those shows don't include the historic legend as she was disregarding network directions and belting out a national hymn with many of those executives right in the audience, bringing them to tears, bringing them to their knees. Why don't we know about this? Listeners, I still find that the answer is in this work. What role does the Judy Garland show have in TV history? My belief is it's a wobbly American bridge and one that we don't like to look at or talk about because because it's wobbly. It's an important visual transition for a country that was facing an increasingly accelerated pace of change. The show balanced America's music standards of the past with the new faces and sounds. Judy herself leveraged old-time stars but was packaged in this sophisticated wardrobe. 
she should have been the stage leader. The comic sketches should have been stronger, but the music was pure gold. There was a lot of ambiguity. The writing was often just flat out miserable, even like the, the chatter. But everyone who had to read those lines was darn grateful for the opportunity to work with Judy Garland. So the Judy Garland show, 1963 to 1964, 26 episodes. It's a series for scholars and for people who want to better understand the entertainment industry at its best and worst. And it's for people who just really want to understand what classic American entertainment was as it was born on the stage and screen, the big screen, and then ultimately brought to TV for just a brief period of time. It's all wrapped up in one show. Listeners, this has been a great topic to transition to a season format. Judy Garland, there's just so much to think about. The decision to go in this direction is largely due to the enormous feedback I received from you, saying that what makes Advanced TV history so distinct from other podcasts are the moments when we take a close view of TV history, and then see how it connects to today. That's the blend of sociology, gender studies, history, and business that few other podcasts offer. So no matter how you came to listen to this episode or any of the past episodes, know that you can find us other places as well. We try hard to make our work available for convenient listening, and you know We'd be incredibly grateful if you'd take a few minutes to share this show with someone who might enjoy this fresh take on Judy Garland. Even more so if, in sharing this podcast, you open the door, the whole door, to podcasts, which really are just audio programs, like listening to the radio, sort of, to someone who otherwise finds the idea of listening to a podcast to be complicated, downright intimidating. Help that person. As a matter of fact, just say to them, find the just press play button of Advanced TV Herstory at the tvherstory.com website. Or go to Pandora and, and search Advanced TV Herstory. We're even on YouTube. On social media, you can find us. Our Twitter handle is TV Herstory. And on Instagram, Advanced TV Herstory. And as always, our email is Advanced TV Herstory at gmail.com. For this important season on Judy's show, The 60s Judy, we owe a great thank you to Angela Ingersoll. She brings her love and knowledge of Judy everywhere, including our studio here in Chicago. Such tremendous energy and heart. Ugh. We wish her the very best as her show, Get Happy, builds its audience, travels the country, and we really hope to have her back here at Advanced TV Herstory for more fun. If you want to know more about the Judy Garland Show, the series, I highly recommend Coyne Stephen Sanders' book, The Judy Garland Show, Rainbow's End. I've quoted Sanders' research and direct quotes from that book, though all those interviews, that are now going on 30 years of age. Wow. This is We're coming up on the anniversary of The Wizard of Oz and of Judy Garland's series. Ugh, a lot of really great stuff out there. Okay, as we leave and, and, and finish this episode of Advanced TV Herstory's look at The Judy Garland Show, I have to, of course, give credit behind the scenes to two people who make this show what it is. Jen Eads of Brassy Broadcasting, who serves as audio editor, and Catherine Yang who is associate producer and video director. Very talented, true believers in the work we're doing. And that background music, that's Jazzer's Take Me Higher, which you can find at freemusicarchive.com. I leave you with this. In 1963, Judy Garland said in an interview, you really want to know why I'm tackling a weekly television series? Because CBS is letting me be myself, letting me be a whole total, complete person. Listeners, be yourself. Be whole. Give it your all. Thanks for listening, and thank you for recommending us to others. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis.
Abrams. <laughs>